Hello, it's Marty Braden again. If this is your first time watching one of my videos, let me welcome you to my channel. As my channel's homepage shows, I'm the author of An Atheist Delusion, which is my 438-page response to evolutionary biologist and world-renowned atheist Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. In it, he gives multiple arguments in an effort to try and convince his readers that God doesn't exist. If you go to my channel, Martin Braden Author, you will find that I've recorded 130 videos covering each chapter of my book in detail, where I break down all the arguments and topics Dawkins brings up in his book. It's my perspective as a Latter-day Saint on the big questions. Having finished those videos, I started a new series of videos called Dispelling the Accusatory Fog, where I take on some of the more insidious accusations that are still being hurled at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today. Our critics use the pejorative moniker of the Mormons. Now, what I'm going to say next does not apply carte blanche to all ex-Mormons. Please understand that. But it does apply to most anti-Mormon critics. From what I have observed, most of them become quite full of themselves, and that's because I believe once they step away from the church, they begin to take on the stains of the world, having given up on and removed the protection that the gospel of Jesus Christ's full armor of God once gave them. Most of these critics become haughty and high-minded about their newfound views and perspectives, such that they mock and deride the standards of the gospel that Jesus himself taught. Many of these ex-anti-Mormon critics I know, especially the more sardonic ones, having set aside the safeguards they once kept and held dear to their core, openly mock the five main covenants members make in the temple. Instead of holding fast to that which is good, wholesome, and right, these modern-day corridors have tossed it by the wayside, making and keeping sacred Abrahamic covenants once gave them power and protection from the stains of the world. Whereas now, no longer being clothed in the robes of righteousness, nor filled with the power they received in the temple to overcome the world and dispel its accusatory fog, they cling to the accolades of those with like-mindedness. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying that all ex-Mormons take this path and immediately jump into breaking the law of chastity or something like that. I know they don't. But what I am saying is that the vast majority of these dear brothers and sisters, and I say brothers and sisters because even though they're no longer members of the church of record, they're still our brothers and sisters. It's clear that they reached the point in their lives where they decided to shed themselves of the so-called binding chains that they felt were keeping them from being their true selves so they can enjoy all that the world has to offer. In other words, they no longer want to be under the thumb such a, of a, such a high-demand orthodox religion anymore. They now want to live a new, freedom-filled lifestyle, unfettered by the commandment chains and all the rules, shackles, that they felt were forced upon them by the church. They no longer believe the LDS church is the true church and kingdom of God on the earth. They, like so many other spiritual immature members of the church, in my opinion, have fallen victim to the dark choir of voices and have been blinded by the accusatory fog that swirls all around us today. Let me make myself clear here. I love all of God's children. I do. I hurt when I learn that someone is hurting or has cognitive dissonance or has a faith crisis and has felt the need to leave the church. I do not hold myself above any of these individuals who have chosen to leave the church or that have been excommunicated from it. I'm not their judge. That said, today's video, this video, is going to be about pride. And that's because I believe that one of, if not the most powerful ways to dispel the accusatory fog is to eliminate pride in ourselves so that we can see what God wants us to see. The truth is, pride is the very fountain from which the accusatory fog, uh, fog flows. Because this video series I'm doing is focused on dispelling the accusatory fog, I'm going to share with you some of my personal feelings about what I think the most important way to dispel this dark choir of voices and the accusatory fog is. The most powerful and effective way to dispel the accusatory fog is to remove pride from our own hearts and minds. In the book of Proverbs it says, quote, Pride goeth before destruction. And then it says, A haughty spirit comes before a fall. Like I said in my last video, ex-members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, ex-Mormons like Kara Burrell, Bill Reel, John Dalen, Samantha Shelley, and Tanner Gilliland, and I could name many others, when they leave the church, 
they soon become latter-day core whores choosing to criticize and spew their hatred and anger for the church, its leaders, its doctrines, and especially its policies, reviling against all things Mormon in their daily spiritual, emotional, and mental diet. They can't seem to get enough of it. It's become its own kind of addiction or daily fix for them. Why can't they just leave it and us alone? It's a query to me. It's because of their pride, I think, and many of us members also suffer from this sin of pride. So let me lay the groundwork now for why I believe that pride is at the heart of the accusatory fog, and then share with you why I believe that the only way to dispel it is for each of us to get rid of pride in ourselves and not focus on our critics' hearts, although Dusty Smith's an example of how it can happen when you focus on somebody like his friend Mike did. By getting rid of pride in our hearts, we can receive the gift and power of the Holy Ghost and His witness of truth, telling us answers to our questions. That's the beauty of it. If you, want, uh, if you were to ask any one of these anti-Mormons I mentioned, and almost any other anti-Mormon you might know personally, I bet they'd all tell you that they, after years of being away from the church, no longer believe in God or Jesus Christ and His atonement like they once did as active members of the LDS Church. They now speak of a higher power or of the universe and not specifically in a divine being such as God or His Son, Jesus Christ, and the atonement. I've watched and heard both Kara Burrell and John Dalen say as much, and I've watched Kara, Bill, Samantha, and Gilliland actually rave openly about taking drugs and enjoying their new sexual freedom. As a result of them taking on the stains of the world, they've simply discarded the idea of God altogether, and especially their need for a savior of any kind personally. As I said, I believe it is pride that's behind these folks' inability to simply leave the church and its members alone and just go about leading their lives as they choose. Another reason they can't seem to leave it um, or leave it alone, I believe, is that they discovered that by being anti-Mormon critics, they can actually make money off their spewing their criticisms, accusations, and lies about the Mormons, especially when they are sensationalized and provocative topics that attract struggling members who find themselves suffering from cognitive dissonance. The so-called Mormon church, as they refer to us, seems to be a topic that the entire world has a curiosity for. It seems as though apps like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and other places where people control the internet seem to be chucked full of these critics' attacks. When these people finally reach the bottom of their downward pride spiral, once they've eaten the entirety of the dirty, rotten, stinking rat called the stains of the world, and their entire moral foundation, once built on God's word, has been completely replaced with the foundation built on man's word, it having no objective truth or moral compass planks within it. As you talk to these ex-anti-saints, you soon realize that they have truly bought into the lie that Satan has worked so hard to plant in their minds and hearts, and that is the lie that says there are no objective truths, and that religion is the opium of weak minds that can't handle life's challenges, and so these weak people seek their invisible friend and sky god who does not exist. <laughs> These once elect children of God, having left the faith of their fathers, are now bearing the fruit of their newfound ideology, and this kind of thinking has led them down the path where they soon become a law unto themselves, where anything goes. I'm talking about the fruit born of pride. Here's just a few fruits of this universal sin. Pro-choice advocacy, gender dysphoria, LGBT, excuse me, LGBTQIA23+, same-sex marriage, as well as uncommitted, casual sex, transgenderism, gender alteration and reassignment, using genderism language with all of its unscientific pronouns to brainwash our young children and other deeply disturbing and polarizing subject stances against absolute truth. No longer is there objective truth in their way of thinking. There's only subjective truth, or what is often declared to be my truth. Over the past five to ten years or so, it has become self-evidently clear to me that these folks, after having once enjoyed the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness, after having decided to reject it, they quickly lose the light of truth within them. The scripture says that my spirit will not always strive with man. We see this play out in the individual lives where they end up having a negative, um, excuse me, having to navigate through life's complexities with only the dark choir of voices leading the way. 
Its director is the God of this world, the God of pleasure. And pride is his song. For these folks, they now live a life where pretty much anything goes. Like I said, they soon begin to use such critical terms as the church doesn't provide its people informed consent. The church is homophobic, it's racist, and it promotes sexist and misogynistic, me, misogynistic, I don't use that word very often, I apologize for muffing it, but it's a long one, Mis misogynistic, I can't even say it, uh, misogynistic, I was thinking massage when I think about it, but misogynistic policies, which is all critical of women, I, I just, it's crazy to me. These critics even accuse the church of requiring way too much of its members declaring that it's such a high-demand religion, it injures its adherence because of it. John Dalen did an entire, po entire podcast on this specific accusation. He couldn't hide its, uh, the pride he felt about it all. My friends, can we not see that pride is at the core of all these accusations? Ex-anti-Mormons like Dr. Dalen boast of their egalitarian compassion for all the suffering around them. But in actuality, I believe it's a false compassion. And that's because their real motive, their real motive is to damage and hurt the church and its members, and all the while asking their followers for money so that they can continue their effort to destroy the faith and testimony of members of the LDS Church. It's an act of revenge and hate. Now, I'll just stop and say the core whore thought he was doing a good thing. He got so much success from it that he believed his own lies and ultimately had forgotten that Sharon finally was deceived and he wanted forgiveness and he almost died. He was so sick he got a priesthood blessing that came to life. But Korhor, we all know the story how Satan left him to be trodden under and to die, but he believed his things. He thought he was doing good, but he had been told and he knew deep down it was the truth the gospel of Jesus Christ was true, but he hated it and has a law brain way of thinking. He bought into the lies of pride. I just feel most of these folks, it's become an act of revenge and hate because they've been hurt so deeply. Now, with that said, again, I believe people can change. I truly do. I believe people like Dr. Daling can have a change of heart, but only when they remove pride by becoming humble as a little child. I have a hard time seeing that happen, but Dusty Smith, he was proud. He had anger and hate, and he overcame it. He humbled himself as a little child and pled with his Father in heaven. So anyhow, pride is at the core of the fog and its vitriol. And so I want to talk about how we can get rid of our or dispel the pride that resides in our own hearts and minds, which I believe, as I said, is the fastest and most effective way of dispelling the accusatory fog that's swirling around us and stealing our peace and joy. To begin with, I want to go back in time before, uh, before you and I were ever on this earth. In the pre-mortal council, it was pride that felled Lucifer, a son of the morning. 2 Nephi 24, 12 through 15. See also D&C 76, 25 through 27. See Moses 4, verse 3. At the end of this world, when Christ cleanses the earth by fire, the proud will be burned as stubble, and the meek shall inherit the earth. See 3 Nephi 12.5. See 3 Nephi 25.1. See D&C 29.9. See Joseph Smith History 137 and Malachi 4.1. All talks about this pride being burned at the you know, uh, stubble. President Ezra Tab Benson taught us about pride beautifully. I'm going to quote him now. Most of us think of pride as self-centeredness, conceit, boastfulness, arrogance, or haughtiness. All of these are elements of the sin, but the heart or core is still missing, he said. The central feature of pride is enmity, enmity towards God and enmity towards our fellow man. Enmity means hatred towards or hostility towards God or a state of opposition. A state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over us. He uses enmity to get us to hate one another. Listen to what he said. You heard what he says. I will take anyhow. Pride is essentially competitive in nature. Competitive in nature. We pit our own will against God's will. When we direct our pride toward God, it is in the spirit of my will and not thine be done. As Paul said, they seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ, Philippians 2.21. 
Our will in competition to God's will allows desires, appetites, and passions to go unbridled. See Alma 38, 12 and 3 Nephi 12, 30. The proud cannot accept the authority of God getting direction to their lives. Rules, in other words. Can't have rules. See Helaman 12, 6. They pit their perceptions of truth against God's great knowledge, their abilities versus God's priesthood power, their accomplishments against his mighty works, both on earth and in the heavens. Our enmity towards God takes on many labels such as rebellion, hard-heartedness, stiff-neckedness, unrepentant, puffed up, easily offended, and sign seekers. The proud wish God would agree with them. They aren't interested in changing their opinions to agree with God's. Another major portion of this very prevalent sin of pride is enmity towards our fellow man. We are tempted daily to elevate ourselves above others and diminish everyone else. See Helaman 6.17 and D&C 58.41. The proud make every man their adversary by pitting their intellects, opinions, works, wealth, talents, or any other worldly measuring device against others. Another, in, you know, in the words of C.S. Lewis, he wrote, Pride gets no pleasure out of having something only out of having more of it than the next man. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition has gone, pride has gone. That was in mere Christianity. In the pre, uh, pre-earthly council, Lucifer placed his proposal in competition with the Father's plan as it, you know, as it was advocated by Jesus Christ. He wished to be honored above all others. In short, his prideful desire was to dethrone God. See Moses 4, 1 through 3. See 2 Nephi 24, 13. See DNC 29, 36. See DNC 76, 28. The scriptures abound with evidence of the severe consequences of the sin of pride to individuals, groups, cities, and nations. As I said earlier, pride goeth before destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride's what destroyed the Nephite nations as well as the city of Sodom. See Moroni 8, 27 and Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. It was through pride that Christ was crucified. The Pharisees were wroth because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, which was a threat to their position and power. And so the, they plotted his death. See John eleven fifty three. The same was true of the religionists of Joseph Smith Day. He was just a teen in his 15th year. Saul became an enemy to David through pride and envy. He was jealous because the crowds of Israelitish women were singing that Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. See Samuel 1, 18 verses 6 through 8. The proud stand more in fear of men's judgment than of God's judgment. DNC 3, 6 through 7. DNC 30, 1 through 2. DNC 60, verse 2. What, we, uh, what will men think of me, they think? They ask themselves, what will men think of me? Weighs heavier than what will God think of me? King Noah was about to free the prophet Abinadi, but an appeal to his pride by his wicked priest sent Abinadi to the flames. See Mosiah 7, 11 through 12. Herod sorrowed at the request of his wife to behead John the Baptist. Just think of that for a moment. He succumbed to his need for recognition and pride. Herod's prideful desire to look good to them which sat with him at meat caused him to have the Baptist beheaded. Matthew 14, verse 9. See also Mark 6 through 26. What a story. Fear of men's judgment manifests itself in the competition for men's approval. The the proved, proud, excuse me, the proud love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. John 12, 42 through 43. Our motives for the things we do are where the sin is manifest. Jesus said he did always those things that pleased God. John 8, 29. Would we not do well to have the pleasing of God as our motive rather than to try to elevate ourselves above our brothers and sisters by trying to outdo them? Some prideful people are not so concerned as to whether their wages meet their needs as they are that their wages are more than someone else's. Their reward is being a cut above the rest, so to speak. This is the enmity of pride. When pride has a hold on our hearts, we lose our independence from the world and deliver our freedoms to the bondage of men's judgment. Wow. The world shouts louder than the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. The reason of men overrides the revelations of God, and the proud lets go of the iron rod, the iron rod being Christ himself. See 1 Nephi 8, 19 through 28, 1 Nephi 11, verse 25, 1 Nephi 15, verse 20 through 14. 
Pride's what's keeping us from hearing these whisperings of the Holy Ghost above the shrilling scream of accusations made by the accuser of the brethren and his minions. We need to eliminate our proud pride so we can become humble, so that we can hear that spirit. Pride is a sin that can readily be seen in others, but is rarely admitted in ourselves. Most of us consider pride to be a sin for those at the top, such as the rich and the learned, because they look down on the rest of us, right? 2 Nephi 9.42 There is, however, a far more common ailment among us, and that is pride from the bottom, looking up. It is manifested in so many ways, such as fault-finding, gossiping, backbiting, murmuring, living beyond our means, envying, coveting, withholding gratitude and praise of others to others. Disobedience is essentially a prideful power struggle against someone in authority over us. It can be a parent, a priesthood teacher, a leader, or ultimately God. A proud person hates the fact that someone is above him. He thinks his, this lowers his position, such as the narcissism of Lucifer and his desire to have the power that God uh, had so that he could sit on God's throne. Selfishness is one of the more common faces of pride. How everything affects me is the center of all that matters. Self-conceit, self-pity, the victim mentality, the victim syndrome, worldly self-fulfillment, self-gratification, and self-seeking. Pride results in secret combinations, which are built up to get power and to gain and the glory of the world. See Helaman 7, 5, Ether 8, 9, and 16, the 22 through 23, Moses 5, 31, about these secret combinations. This fruit of the sin of pride, namely secret combinations, brought down both the Jaredite and the Nephite civilizations has been and will yet be the cause of the fall of many nations today. We're seeing this play out in our own country today. See Ether 8, 18 through 25, as we form our own secret combination. I think we have our own little cliques and secret combinations, and it's all spurred on by the core um, state of mind called pride. Another face of pride is contention, arguments, fights, unrighteous dominion, generation gaps, divorces, spouse abuse, riots, and disturbances. All of these fall into this category of pride, the universal sin. The scriptures tell us that only by pride cometh contentions, Proverbs 13, 10. See also Proverbs 28, 25. We're seeing the fruit of pride manifesting itself all across the globe today. The scriptures testify that the proud are easily offended and hold grudges. See 1 Nephi 16, 1-3. The proud withhold forgiveness to keep another in their debt and to justify their injured feelings. Wow, that's so incredibly true. The stories I could tell you about this. The proud do not receive counsel or correction easily. See Proverbs 15, verse 10. Amos 5, verse 10. Defensiveness is used by all of us to justify and rationalize our frailties and failures. See Matthew 3, 9 and John 6, 30 through 59. I'm going to relate this to me personally here shortly. Oh my, wait. The proud depend upon the world to affirm whether they have value or not. Their self-esteem is determined by where they are judged to be on the ladders of worldly success. They feel worthwhile as individuals as long as the numbers beneath them in achievement talent, beauty, or intellect are large enough. Pride is ugly. It says, if you succeed before me, I'm a failure. Pride is a damning sin in the true sense of the word. It limits, that's what damning means, it limits or stops progression. Alma 12, 10 through 11. The proud are not easily taught. 1 Nephi 15, verse 3 and 7 through 11. They won't change their minds to accept truth because, because to do so implies they have been wrong. And we know narcissists can't ever be wrong, right? Pride adversely affects all our relationships. Our relationship with God and His servants, between husband and wife, parent and child, employer and employee, teacher and student, and all mankind for that matter. Christ wants to lift us to where He is. We, uh, do we desire to do the same for others, to lift them and go down and lift them and help them and love them? Pride separates and divides us by ranks according to our riches and our chances for learning, etc. 3 Nephi 6.12 Unity is impossible for a proud, a proud people, and unless we are one, we are not the Lord's. See Mosiah 18.21, D&C 38.27, D&C 105.2-4, and Moses 7 and 18. Think of the many people who are less active members of the LDS Church because they were offended. They probably had reason to be because of our own pride. 
pushing them away. Their pride just will not allow them to forgive or fully sup at the Lord's table. Pride affects all of us at various times and to at varying degrees. Now, you can see why the building in Lehi's dream was represented as a large and spacious building. The pride of the world and great was the multiple, multiple that did enter into it. See 1 Nephi 8, 26, 33, and 1 Nephi 11, 35 through 36. Pride is the universal sin, as I said, and the antidote for pride is what? Humility, meekness, and submissiveness. See Alma 7, 23. It is having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. See 3 Nephi 9, 20, 3 Nephi 12, 19, D&C 20, 37, D&C 59, 8, Psalms 34, 18, Isaiah 57, 15, Isaiah 62, excuse me, 66, verse 2. We can choose to humble ourselves. We can choose to humble ourselves by confessing and forsaking our sins and being born of God. These steps allow us to be humble as a little child so that we can receive the answers to our questions about the church. See D&C 58, 43. See Mosiah 27, 25 through 26. See Alma 5, 7 through 14 and verse 49. We can choose to humble ourselves by loving God and submitting our will to His by putting Him first in our lives. See 3 Nephi 11, 11. See 3 Nephi 13, 33 and Moroni, or excuse me, yeah, Moroni 10, verse 32. Pride is the great stumbling block to Zion. Boy. Let me repeat that. Pride is the great stumbling block to Zion. We must cleanse the inner vessel by conquering pride. See Alma 6, 2 through 4. Matthew 23, verse 25 through 26. We must yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, put off the prideful natural man, become a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and become as a child, submissive, meek, and humble. And by doing so, we can come to know the truth of all things. Mosiah three nineteen. See also Alma 13, 28. Okay, that's the end of President Benson's talk on proud. Oh, did it prick you like it did me? That, my friends, should make it obvious why so many choose to leave the church and start attacking it, each one joining the accusatory fog. As I said, pride is the source and heart of the accusatory fog. It's what's blocking people from getting the answers they're seeking regarding the difficult and complex questions that have been and still are hurled at us by our critics. Only by removing or at least by diminishing the pride that resides in our heart and mind towards God, the church, its members, and its doctrines can we become humble as a little child and thus recognize we've received the Holy Ghost. When pride rules in one's life, the answers we seek will not, will not be recognized and we will only hear the dark choir of voices. So, how do we remove pride from our lives so that we can dispel this accusatory fog and receive the answers we seek? It is actually pretty simple, really. It's through daily repentance. The simple truth is that there truly is a need in everyone's life for daily repentance, meaning changing for the better. And therefore, there's an absolute need for a Savior. Otherwise, chaos uh, will be the ruler of the day so that it steals one's peace. Without these two truths existing, there is absolutely no purpose in this life or to the universe. It's also impossible for anyone to get these important answers to life's big questions without daily repentance so that we can access the gift of the Savior's love. For without the action called repentance, life would simply stay in constant chaos, having no objective morality to help mankind uh, bring order to the chaos surrounding us. Someone asked, why a need for a Savior, especially the requirement that this saving sacrifice had to be a perfect holy God in order for it to be the right kind of sacrifice, one that would satisfy the law? What law? Satisfy what? What in the law? Why did this have to be a sacrifice of God's life in such an enigmatic way? By crucifixion, these two objective truths, the need for repentance and the need for a Savior, are the only truths, when acted on, that have the power to bring the natural man into subjection, where he or she willingly submits to the law and changes their direction. By our willingness to submit to the laws of God, chaos is dispelled and ceases to exist in the world. Imagine if everybody repented, the world's chaos would cease to exist. Let me say here that it wasn't until I realized that even though I had never committed any real heinous sins in my life, I had most definitely sinned. That's for sure. And therefore I needed a Savior. I still need a Savior. Like the scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But because I thought my sins were so minor, 
they somehow didn't require true, sincere repentance. And this, my friends, is the very definition of self-righteous and self-righteousness. And so in a moment, I'm going to lay out for you a list of my weaknesses and the sins I often repeated on a daily basis until I went to Heavenly Father with a sincere heart and asked Him, Heavenly Father, what do I need to repent for? What am I doing so wrong that I can't see or am blind to it? Well, I was immediately convicted in my heart by the Spirit of the Lord, and it began telling me what my unrepented sins were. I actually felt the Spirit cutting me to the quick, my very center and core, and the Spirit began rattling off a list, a long list of transgressions. This list showed me unequivocally, without question, that I truly had a need for repentance, which immediately meant that I absolutely had a need for a Savior. This experience of hearing God speak to me in to my very core with these kinds of feelings, it was life-changing. It was transformational. The Spirit told me that I was never going to eliminate chaos from my life, which I had to deal with on a daily basis for years until I repented of these sins and transgressions on a daily basis. The truth is, these two needs apply to you and everyone else as well. Let me define what I mean by repentance. Godly sorrow should be and truly is the fruit of of a sincere recognition of one's sins. True repentance recognizes and accepts the fact that you have and do sin daily. But what is the act of repentance itself when it comes to one's behaviors? Well, I'm going to share my list of such behaviors with you and you'll soon understand what I'm talking about. First, let's start with its definition. The biblical meaning of the Hebrew verb to repent is shuv. It's to turn and go a different direction. In Greek, the term repent is rendered metanoia, meaning to change one's mindset. So to repent is to recognize the sense of guilt that your action stirs within you. And this sense of guilt is the light of Christ speaking to your heart and that something's amiss and that something needs to change. It's the feeling and reminder that you're not going in the direction that a child of God should be going. And therefore, you need to change your course or direction that you're currently taking. Repentance, therefore, is changing one's mind to make a change of direction in one's behavior, even a change in one's thinking, or like I like to call it, mental mapping. That's what it's all about. The fruit, excuse me, if the fruit of true repentance is godly sorrow, this is an important question, if the fruit of true repentance is godly sorrow, and you're not feeling this emotion of godly sorrow, this godly sorrow spoken of in the scriptures, then you probably haven't truly repented. Godly sorrow is a gift of the Spirit that comes from having effectively and sincerely pursued the process of true repentance. At its heart is you coming to a deep realization that your actions have offended Heavenly Father and His Son. And, and here's the big one, that you have hurt others in the process too. When this sense of guilt pricks your heart and you recognize it, and you recognize it, it should produce in you a sharp and keen awareness that your behavior has caused the Savior who knew no sin and is the greatest of all to endure agony and suffering because of your individual sins, as well as causing pain and suffering in others. This godly sorrow should draw from deep within your most inner self, within your inner bosom, the state of mind called a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This state of mind flows out of your heart because your conscience has brought to your remembrance the agony and suffering of the Savior endured. And in some small way, you're able to feel His suffering for you, as well as feel the sufferings and pain that others have experienced because of your actions, too. To help magnify this truth, I have a story. This story was told to me when I was just a teen of 14, 15 years old. It's about a small mountain town that had a small town school like the one seen on the TV show Little House on the Prairie. It's also about the same time period in the 1800s. 12 to 15 children from the age of 6 years old on up to 18 years old attended that school. As the story goes, the town's teachers kept quitting due to the boys in the school being so unruly and continually taunting the teachers, so much so that every last one of them quit. One day, after the most recent teacher quit, a young man came into town and decided to apply for the school's teaching position. The city leaders accepted the man's application, and he was told to he could start on Monday of the following week. On that Monday morning, the teacher arrived early so he could welcome each of the children as they came into the school. Once they were all seated and quieted down, the teacher said, 
I'm going to need your help with this class. In order for all of you to complete your studies, assuming you need and want to learn, you'll need to help me in setting the rules for the class. He told them that if you all decide that you want to come to class to learn and that you are willing to abide by the rules that you all will choose for this class going forward, then we will be successful. So who of you wants to learn all that you can? After a few moments, every last one of the children raised their hand to the affirmative. Okay, okay, the teacher said. Tell me what you think the rules should be in order for our class to keep from becoming a class of chaos instead of a class of learning. Well, each of the children thought about it and then began to propose the rules. And soon they had ten rules that they all agreed upon and committed to follow. Then the teacher said, these are great rules, but do you think there should be a punishment for anyone who breaks the rules and makes the class turn into chaos? Without a punishment, there's no law or rules, he said. The children thought and thought and thought about it, and finally they said the punishment should be, quote, 10 lashes with a thick, thick stick on your bare back when anyone breaks a rule. The teacher said, don't you think that's a bit too harsh? But the children said, no, because it means we all want to treat the class as being something really important to us, and that kind of stiff punishment shows we mean business. Okay, Tim, the, then the teacher agreed. He then wrote the rules down on paper and had each student sign the copy of the rules and said, we're ready to begin school. After a few days of having class and doing regular school things, one of the students came to the teacher sheepishly and said, teacher, someone broke one of my rules, uh, broke one of the rules, uh, teacher, and, and ate my lunch without asking. The teacher brought the student within him, with him to the front of the class and told them what had happened. He said, we can't continue our class until the thief comes forward and admits what they did. Well, after a few minutes of uncomfortable silence, a little boy named Jimmy hesitantly raised his hand and said, teacher, I, I did it. The teacher felt so bad for him because he knew the boy's circumstances, but he knew the class was going to expect him to execute the punishment now. And so he told Jimmy to come up and take off his coat and lay himself over the top of the desk, chest first. Jimmy pled to keep his coat on, but finally he had to relinquish. As Jimmy reluctantly took off his overcoat, he had no shirt, just his suspenders holding up his worn-out, high-watered pants. His, this little boy was so skinny that he looked like he hadn't eaten for a month. The teacher took the long, thick punishment stick in his hand and was about to began lashing Jimmy when the oldest boy in the class, Johnny, shouted out, Stop, teacher, stop! Isn't there a rule that says someone can take your licking for you? The teacher said, Why, yes, Johnny, there is. So Johnny said, I'll take Jimmy's licking for him. And he walked up to Johnny, uh, as he walked, and he walked up to Jimmy and told him to go back to his seat. Jimmy was now crying all the way back to the desk. Johnny then took off his shirt and laid his large bareback torso, it having got so strong from all the working in the fields. He put himself over the top of the desk and said to the teacher, Okay, I'm ready to take the licking. The teacher, holding back his tears now, took the stick and began whacking Johnny's bare back while all the children looked on in absolute abject horror. After seven whacks, wham, 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 well, the whipping stick broke, and little Jimmy ran up to Johnny and threw his bony arms around Johnny's neck, crying, I love you, Johnny. I love you till I die. I love you for taking my lickings for me. I can't read that story without crying. As we realize and remember that Jesus took upon himself the end of the law, in other words, our lickings, even the punishment of death, the punishment, I believe, we approved at the Grand Council in Heaven before we began our class here on this earth. It's my belief we all agreed to the rules for the class as well as the punishment when we failed to keep the rules, but we also knew that God offered up a Johnny to take our lickings. I personally think this was bear, uh, partly the case of the, great, um, of the cause for the great war in Heaven. Satan and his followers did not want the risk of failing to obey the rules because they didn't think or like the punishment we would have to endure if we failed. Not only the rules, but when we failed to love our Johnny, so to speak, the Son of God, our Savior. Father chose Jesus to be our Savior instead of Lucifer. 
Jesus stepped in as payment to satisfy justice due to our sins. And in doing so, he also satisfied mercy on the conditions of repentance, which we all agree to. In taking our lickens for us, even the punishment of death for our sins, he also took on him our sufferings. And in doing so, Jesus satisfied the demands of justice that we had all agreed to, which the perfect teacher, our Heavenly Father, set in place. This atonement, the taking our lickens for us, is Jesus, our Heavenly Father's gift of love, which gift is freely given to each of us, his children, if, if we but accept it in faith and willingly keep his commandments on the condition of repentance or the rules. Now, you may be asking yourself, Marty, what does all of this have to do with dispelling the accusatory fog? Come on, get on it. Well, let me answer that. With this as a backstory and knowing that only the only way I would uh, receive light from the Spirit of the Holy Ghost is to get rid of my pride, I seriously reflected on my many weaknesses and trespasses that God's Spirit brought to my remembrance. And I immediately began to recognize and feel the pain and suffering that others had felt due to my actions and behaviors. It was not only my wife's and children's pain, but the pain of others too. I realized I was blind to many of their sufferings. I soon found myself feeling the degree of the suffering that Jesus took on himself because of the individual sins and transgressions that I've committed. They were like me eating someone else's food without asking kind of sin. I more keenly felt the reality that Jesus bled great drops of blood from every pore that day due to my sins and my transgressions, both those of commission and those of omission. Let me say that if you haven't felt this godly sorrow lately, this feeling called a broken heart and a contrite spirit, that mindset, and you don't feel any discomfort for causing the suffering that Jesus suffered on your behalf, especially as you partake of the emblems of the sacrament ordinance, I would suggest that you take this time right now to run through your personal list of daily behaviors, like the list I'm going to share with you shortly. I'm speaking of those behaviors that probably seem to you to be small and of no significance, but nonetheless loom large in the spouse's mind and heart and in the minds and heart of your children, friends, and even some strangers you don't even know you hurt. Take a moment to feel and understand what each of them have been feeling and have felt because of your actions and behaviors. We're so selfish, we think of our own discomfort, our own guilt, that feeling of guilt for us. We're just in here in our own head, our own heart, instead of reaching out and saying, oh my goodness. Like I said, Jesus took on and suffered our lickings for us. Don't just think about your sins and how they caused pains and sufferings for Jesus. Think about how your spouse, your children, and your friends felt within their hearts, minds, and bodies, and you didn't even recognize it or acknowledge it. I hope you can see and can feel that there's truly a need for you to have a Savior, even when you haven't committed any heinous sins. There's certainly a need for a Savior when we commit heinous sins, for we know there's grievous sufferings when such such crimes like murder, rape, and robbery are committed. Not only the pain of guilt and suffering one feels in themselves for such an abominable act, but we feel the pain of the victims all around us, Uh, that have been affected by such heinous sins. Now then, let me say that today is the day for change, a day for repentance, a day where you can decide once and for all to be better, a day to decide to be the child of God you are. Today is the day for you and me to make the decision to change our direction and direct our behavior towards God and His Son. Today is the day to be and do better, to be the better you and do better things. To me, It's being more like the Savior Jesus Christ. Today is the day for you and me to become as a little child, humble and meek and submissive, so that we can open the door uh, to correction from our Heavenly Father. Today is the day to show our desire to our Savior and our Father in Heaven that we want to become the child of God we know we are and uh, and that He desires us to become. I promise you that as a literal spirit and child of God, you have divinity within you. You have divinity within you. And because you do, you have the capacity to become divine and holy as you work to refine those attributes of divinity within you in embryo. These attributes, your spiritual DNA inheritance, exists in their fullness and perfection in the Savior. The Savior twice commanded us to be perfect, even as He and our Father in Heaven are perfect, which means complete in their oneness in the Greek. Achieving this oneness in love, it's 
Uh, it's not done overnight, of course. It's acquired principle by principle, line upon line, precept by precept, here a little and there a little, until we have come to live more fully the celestial law. We receive the blessings that are predicated on the laws of happiness as we abide by them. These blessings give us the power to become perfect or complete in Christ as we take on his divine character. It's called becoming one in his love. So, okay now. After several years of being married to my angelic companion, I finally admitted to myself that I was still and am a pretty rough stone that needed some real tumbling and the rock polisher machine called life, its purpose being the removal of all my rough edges and to smooth and more uh, refinely polish me into a beautiful, pure, divine stone of light and love. In other words, I finally accepted my imperfections openly. I'm especially talking about when I was only 25 or maybe I was 30 years old. After I finished my mission, I was definitely a rough stone in many ways. But years later, I took on honest uh, look at myself, which uh, self-reflection I most definitely found to be quite difficult for me to do, especially the having to admit I actually had these kind of weaknesses. But with God's help, His mercy, and the enabling power of His grace, I finally humbled myself and asked, Marty, how do you see yourself today? I continued, how are you treating the love of your life and the seven children she's helping you raise? How are you treating those you associate with in your daily walk? Are you kind and gentle and meek and lowly towards them today? Well, after giving it some honest and serious time of self-reflection, I prayed and asked God, Heavenly Father, can you tell me what I need to do to take on the character of Christ? Well, I can honestly tell you that what I experienced at that moment was a genuine desire to repent, welling up in me. God's Spirit immediately came over me and filled my heart and mind, my knower, with light in the form of a flood of thoughts and images of my life that played on the screen of my mind. Accompanying this was a clear recognition that I had a need to change my behavior in many, many things. But what caught me off guard was that I also felt a feeling of love coming over me as I thought on the Savior and what He did for me personally. I'm absolutely convinced that it was the Holy Ghost speaking to me, for it was a small, quiet, still thought of feelings that penetrated my very core, my center, and the Spirit spoke to me by those feelings. His words cut me to the core and began showing me where I had been lax in my belief that I needed to repent daily and that I wasn't offering up a broken heart and a contrite spirit each Sunday. And that's because I was prideful. I learned that because of who I was and in many ways who I still am, I experienced a great deal of emotional pain and spiritual suffering as my behaviors were brought to my remembrance one after another. Bam, 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 bam. As you'll see, it was a long list. Because, okay, please keep in mind that there weren't any seriously heinous transgressions brought to my mind, whew, such as the infidelity, persistent swearing, stealing, breaking the word of wisdom, and the like. And I know some of you have experienced that. I'm not your judge. This applies to you too. My sins were mem uh, memories of how I had allowed myself to fall prey to my tempter, or excuse me, my temper because of my prideful heart. This is just one set's example of my bad behavior. In other words, I was verbally and emotionally abusive to my wife and children at times. I was not always kind, gentle, meek, and showing love unfeigned towards them continually. So to this day, still to this day, I find myself succumbing to the many faces of pride that still show their head, but it is far less often now. Whew, thank goodness. These behaviors, of course, stemmed from my prideful immaturity and my lack of awareness and blindness to my shortcomings, each one revealing that I had several blind spots that seemed to manifest themselves in my shortcomings, transgression, weaknesses, and yes, in my repeated sins. This list I'm going to share with you isn't going to be in order. But I feel strongly that I need to share the list of my behaviors with you. I often chose to uh, simply brush them off and brush them aside or ignore them because I didn't feel the necessity of repenting for them. Because like I said, in my mind, they were too small. They were just me being human. Again, this blindness to the seriousness of these weaknesses was due to my pride. And I will tell you this, too often they revealed their ugly head in my daily life, resulting in both my family and sometimes friends feeling hurt. But I'm happy to say, I'm happy to say that over time, as God mercifully 
tutored me and softened my heart. I was finally ready to take ownership of these weaknesses and transgressions. And I have been more willing to face the music in consequence for my behaviors over the last several years. I'm now going to go through that list with you. This list obviously conveys my humanness and the fruits of the natural man that we are all battling within. And as I said, many of my weaknesses still show their ugly head every now and then, which brings me spiritual pain and at times spiritual suffering, such that I am definitely able to feel a broken heart and a contrite spirit because of how I've made my family and others feel, and especially how I've made the Savior and Heavenly Father feel about me and my sins in particular. The real source of my brokenheartedness and my feeling a contrite spirit comes from me finally sensing and realizing that those closest to me did and still do feel real pain and suffering due to my behavior, behaviors whose root is pride. Today I'm able to acknowledge their sufferings and their sufferings of my Savior because I've become humble. I've worked hard to chip away at my pridefulness. This process of repentance, as I've described it, has become very real to me. And this realization has helped me change the direction of my behavior. In fact, I recently had a transformational experience within this. It was during and after I had attended the temple where I heard repeated in my mind again and again the words of the initiatory ordinance, the language of the instruction of the endowment, and most especially the wording of the sealing ordinances for both the sealing of husband to wife as well as the sealing of a child to parents. This language was absolutely celestial in nature, even more so than I had ever felt it before. The list I'm going to share with you is not by any means complete, but it does reveal the reality of the fact that there were plenty of and still are plenty of reasons for my wife and my family to feel the need to go and search for ways to cope and deal with my unbecoming behaviors, having been born of my pride, manifesting in a plethora of weaknesses that you'll soon hear. It's hard for me to be so candid and open, but I feel strongly that I need to do this. By God's grace, my wife and children were able to find enough courage and desire to continue on with me in our journey through this world of complexities and not leave me. We together have and still are working to take on the character of Christ. And I will tell you that I've successfully taken tiny steps of progress towards the celestial city where Christ lives by staying firmly on the covenant path that leads to that city, repenting daily. So here's a sampling of what I'm talking about when I say my flaws. As I read this list, I would ask that you consider and do a little self-reflection on what your list might look like. I hope you'll still think kindly of me as you listen to my list, knowing that these are my shortcomings. I am going to direct them to you so that you can ask yourself whether or not any of them fit or describes who you are presently. This list can be directed to both men and women, you ladies out there, in this incredible cyberspace world called the YouTube community. Okay, here it goes. Do you at times act disrespectful towards your spouse and children? Do they see you as being disrespectful to them? Do you show selfish self-centeredness at times? How often? Do you have narcissistic tendencies at times in an effort to keep control of your world? So you act as though no one else's matters and much of your wants and only your wants matter. Do you come across as a bully who uses bullying tactics so that others submit to you and take a backseat to your will? Do you sometimes treat your spouse or children in a way that makes them feel like you see him or her or them as an it? A trophy to hang on your arm in order to puff you up, your ego, so that uh, you can be seen as having value. See this beautiful woman or this handsome man or this talented child in my arm and not as incredible, intelligent, valuable persons in their own right? Do you see them, uh, do you see, seem to give off, excuse me, the impression that you care more about your interests rather than their interests? Do you at times show a lack of consideration by being sloppy and lazy regarding your things like putting away your clothes, shocks, and cleaning up after yourself? Are you at times non-communicative and cold or indifferent when confronted with a criticism or conflict, leaving your spouse to, or child to feel low, unappreciated, and feeling a lack of connection towards you? Do you seem to be unaware or emotionally blind of your spouse's and children's emotional needs? Do you simply feed your own emotions and needs, resulting in your loved ones feeling lack of emotional intimacy and support from you? Have there been or are there still far too many experiences of butting heads regarding finances? Usually at the heart of this conflict, 
um, of this conflict about finance and this topic, it's one's financial carelessness and immaturity due to distorted beliefs about risk, sound money management, as well as the pressure that the lack of sufficient funds is putting on you. Its core source being selfishness and pride. Are you self-righteous? Which to me means, like I said, that you have the mindset about yourself that says, I'm more righteous than that person is. See what they say and do? I never do that. In other words, you can be judgmental of your wife and others, and somehow by thinking that way, it will make you feel like you're more superior than they are, more righteous than they are, and more moral than they are, and morally superior than they are. That's all birthed by pride. This usually is the fruit of a low self-image where you are not comfortable in your own skin. So you compensate that feeling or lack or feeling of less than by acting this way. I'm sure you want others to think highly of you. So you um, do you self-ingrandize yourself, which is promoting oneself as being more important or more appreciated than those around you? How do you come off to others? Do you have the mindset that drives you and creates the desire in you for accolades and praise of others so that you put this drive above the drive of providing the security your spouse and children need and deserve? In other words, do you put your needs above theirs? Are you too argumentative? I suppose there are many reasons behind this tendency to be argumentative. It's actually because of the way you think about yourself and others. Its root is pride. Are you too much of a risk taker versus staying conservative with the management of your finances so that your spouse often feels insecure? At times, have you been too harsh of the disciplinarian, too strict with your children, and too judgmental of your spouse? This behavior is usually driven by one's need for perfectionism in others, but for whatever reason, you don't demand the same perfection of yourself. Are you too sedentary at times, not physically active enough? Do you have a lack of caring about your body, your weight, your hygiene, your dress, etc., and your overall health in general? Are you too proud in your relationship as far as decision-making is concerned so that you don't seek others' counsel? Do you have, at times, ambition blindness, poor priority making, where you've let ambition overrule common sense on several levels and end up rejecting your spouse's counsel? Does your daily life's preferences and activities show a lack of consideration for your spouse and children's preferences so that they have uh, had to put their life's desires on hold or maybe even just let them go? Do you have resentment blindness? This is shown when we don't seem to see how what we're choosing to do is causing our spouse or our children to feel resentment towards us. It shows a lack of ability to show we care about what our spouses and children are feeling and what they want and need from us. Are you way too quick to react with defensiveness? Are you took to justify, um, to justify your choices to pursue your priorities over your spouse's and your children's priorities? And at times, are you slow to even acknowledge their priorities? In other words, are you clueless? Do you have the um, needs blindness? Are you too harsh and not gentle in your communications? At times, are you blind to your spouse's and children's needs and too dismissive of their requests for you to meet those needs? Do you put your needs above their needs always? Are you quick to express shame and too fast to show disapproval? Are, are, are you far too slow to express approval and express honest praise to others? Are, your, are you validation blind and illiterate? Validation or validating your spouse or child as a person who has honest needs, feelings, hopes, and sound counsel and expectation for that validation. It's human needs. Does it appear that this is a foreign skill and therefore you lack compassion? Do you often take the approach of being controlling by arguing with your spouse and trying to stay in control of the situation, all in the effort to try and shut them down so you can always have your way? Are you quick to observe or to listen? Or are you too self-absorbed so that you are slow to observe and slow to listen? Are you threatening in your response to conflicts and disagreements? And do you follow the flight option in order to shut down things uh, because you didn't get your way, you stomp off. Anyhow, do you take for granted and shirk your responsibilities as the man or woman of the house, leaving your spouse to do most of the chores and decision making? Do you leave your spouse feeling insecure and unimportant and especially resentful so that they uh, far too often have to go and search for help somewhere else and from someone else? Are you too loud at times, too critical, too condemning, too judgmental, and too self-righteous? Do you react to conflict by using stonewalling or demeaning comments? This is bullying and it's verbal abuse. Are you blind to your own weaknesses? 
It's called weakness blindness. In other words, you don't see your foibles and weaknesses, but you certainly can't identify your you certainly can identify your spouse's weaknesses instantly. In other words, you rarely acknowledge and focus on their strengths, only trying to puff yourself up. Are you sometimes dismissive, which is the opposite of being tender-hearted, gentle, meek, and compassionate? Do you have a variety of kinds of tools in your tool bag that you use to manipulate your spouse and children into allowing you to have your way most of the time, if not all the time? Do you use blame and shame against your spouse and your children? My personal fears and lack of answers or solutions to those fears over the years was a hard thing to me for me to admit and come to grips with, and more especially, to get help with. All of my working years where I took a job and worked for someone else were mostly a bust for me. I was a young man who was unprepared to take on the financial responsibilities of the family, and so it was hard to admit that fact to others, let alone to myself. As a result of my youthful optimism, I started a journey of pursuing multiple startup business ventures, and over a period of many years of trying to be a success in my own business, it proved to be a mixed bag of mostly launch and then failure. My poor wife, what she went through with me and for me brings back so many memories, many of which were quite painful. I'm speaking, of course, about all of my self-employed business ideas that I convinced myself, as well as my wife, that they were the good thing to pursue. I'm a pretty good salesman. I'm sure it was often seen as me chasing a pipe dream and me shirking and running from my responsibilities to get a job and doing the hard thing and providing for my family. What it was, uh, it certainly was tough. But what was tough was the fact that I had entrepreneurial DNA in me. And I thought of nothing else. It was just such a drive. This pattern in my behavior showed its head quite often, and too often for that matter, and it resulting in me uh, and my being slow to find and secure a regular job or to take on one because I didn't feel I could succeed by pursuing another man's dream. As a side note, during my career, I think I became unemployed for as long as 12 months at a time or more on two occasions. And so, as many as you can imagine, it was a very rough road for my spouse and my little children. It was for me too. During those lean years, I hesitated taking on any old job though, and that's because I didn't like it or didn't think it would give me the kind of income I felt I was worth. Again, pride showing its ugly head in me. I felt I was always willing to do whatever it took to support the needs of my family, but, but by waiting for the right job to come my way, it often put us in a hole, and it did it way too many times. I have to say here that the strength and quality of character of my wife is unfathomable, yet our relationship became strained, or what you could describe as shaky, far too many times. This conflict, as I said, stemmed from my pride in my role as the provider. I was often distorted excuse me, it was often distorted so that I could take it, uh, make it fit what my desires and wishes were, setting aside hers. I placed my dreams above the desires and dreams of my family, my wife's hope and her needs. Finally, as a tender mercy and gift of grace, I found a job that provided both the opportunity to pursue a dream and provide the security my wife needed at the time, at the same time. I gave it my attention, my full attention, and after nearly five years with this company, I had made $1.5 million, allowing me to retire back in 2015 with everything paid off. We were finally able to become totally debt-free, including our home and cars, having absolutely no credit card or consumer debt. Please know that it wasn't because I finally got it right, however. Like I said, it was because God opened the door to a unique job business vehicle that allowed me to obey those particular laws which had incredible blessings that were predicated on following those laws of success and happiness. During my wife's and my soon-to-be 48 years of marriage, I always felt that we had good communication, generally. But now, as I look back on our earlier years, I'm not so sure we did. How I see my role in my relationship today has changed considerably since those early years. What I expect from others today is far different than what I expected of them years ago. I listened to the story I had written in my head, which said that they will tolerate me simply because they have faith in God and in the gospel, and that Christ expects them to stick with me no matter what. You know, that self-righteous, proud nonsense. So... Now regarding my marriage and the idea of divorce, I at times felt that my wife found herself wrestling with the question of whether or not she could stay married to me. And that was because I was, dip it was, uh, I was difficult to live with, in other words, at times. Thank goodness she didn't believe divorce was a good option, especially since we had several children in the mix. We had eight children, seven living that she raised. 
I have often felt that she uh, saw me as an inadequate provider and husband, and at times too prideful. She was absolutely right at times. And her passive aggressiveness, though, gave me license to play the victim, which mentality, of course, is the poor me mentality. Again, pride was at the root behind my self-centeredness. So, now let me have you ask yourself, where do you get your sense of personal value from re, uh, from really? Where do you get your personal value from? Do you feel good enough today? In answering these two questions for myself, I began to list out all the ways others have felt unhappy and dissatisfied with their relationship with me. And the conclusion I came to was a list I just read from you. As I saw this list grow in my mind, I realized more deeply that my wife and children absolutely must love me in spite of my weaknesses and shortcomings. Otherwise, there was no good reason for them to have stayed with me for all those many years and those painful years, many of which, like I said, were pretty tough and lean financially. The truth is, I am all of these things to one degree or another. I would say I felt, and I have felt this way more so back in my earlier years and less so today, but I know that seeing and owning all of these weaknesses of mine is the very reason I have come to the deep belief that says, I need a savior, a rescuer from myself and my weaknesses. I need my Johnny. And I absolutely need to exercise daily repentance still to this day. Now that you've heard my list and I said it's not complete, I hope you can see that it's far too long for me to try and get rid of them all at once. It's just not possible. I can say that because even if I were to take these weaknesses on one at a time, giving each one at least, say, three months to conquer it, during those three months it would take me more than 15 years to work through just 50 of these weaknesses that I read off. The reality is that most of these so-called lesser sins and transgressions are going to take me far more than three months to overcome and purge them from my personality. Being that I'm already 70 years old come July, by adding 15 years to that, I would be 85 years old, and so I could be dead long before I get through that list. That said, I'm so glad I started on my list long ago before now. I will tell you that I've been working on some of these embarrassing habits since I was a young newlywed. I found that they've absolutely required daily attention and more especially daily repentance. In trying to eliminate daily change, in other words, in trying to eliminate or at least diminish the frequency of such behaviors, it's made me think more deeply about my pride and daily repentance. In doing so, I have come to the belief that repentance is, in fact, changing to become better. It's a gift. It's true that the more serious sins have a greater degree of guilt and shame attached to them, and so godly sorrow for these sins seems to come more easily. They're easy. Um, they are easy to feel the pain for, in other words. Easy way, excuse me, either way, godly sorrow is required if there is to be a true change of character. The flaws in my character traits that I just listed for you don't carry with them as much godly sorrow or deep pain and embarrassment that the more serious sins do, especially when we break our temple covenants, that's true. But I think that would press upon our conscience like the heat from a blazing fire if we were to partake of the heinous sins. The truth is, I had to learn with all of this is that the flaws I just went through or went over with you are a manifestation that I'm actually breaking my covenants daily, my temple covenants. Listen to the wordings, especially in those ceilings, which therefore requires daily repentance if I'm ever going to conquer the pride that sustains them. I look at each one of these flaws of mine and I can honestly say that each one is out of step with who and what a child of God should be and how a child of God should behave and how I want to behave. To take possession of the attributes of Christ, it requires that I make changes in me, changes in my direction, changes in my mind, and changes in my thinking in how I view my behaviors on a daily basis. But I want you to know that I'm up for it. I know I can do this, changing by choosing to repent daily, but I also know that I can't do that if I hold on to my pride. This giving up or in diminishing one's pride is the pattern we must follow if we want to change from who we are today to who we want to become going forward and in the future. Each day I speak out loud what is truly expected of me. I have a mantra that I've typed up. I read first thing every single morning, and that's wonderful. It's just a wonderful experience, and it's... Uh, when I read it out loud to myself, the Spirit of the Lord says to me, Good job, Marty. I'm so proud of you. Your pride and sins are diminishing daily, and its frequency is wonderful. Good job. Keep it up. 
Well, because of the Savior's love and encouragement, I intend to continue correcting my thinking regarding each of these of my flaws. And I'm doing this by repenting daily, by taking the steps to change my direction and turn myself towards the opposite direction of my poor character traits, selfishness to selflessness, self-promotion to others' promotion, and so on. And I have found that I can do this one day at a time through daily repentance. It's wonderful. I like this process to... Um, I liken this process to me picking up a starfish from off the sandy beach and tossing it out into the sea, all the while saying, I'm done with that dead starfish. Each flaw and weakness of mine matters. My desire to take on the character of Christ daily, and I believe I can do this by tossing one of my weaknesses out into the sea of repented sins, thus removing them from the shoreline of my mental and spiritual mapping. I try to remember that each time I do this, it matters greatly to my spouse and to my family and to my friends and to God especially. Once they're all tossed out to the sea of repented sins, I will have more fully taken on the character of Christ. It is in fact called taking on the name of Christ. The garments we as Latter-day Saints wear are symbolic of this taking on the name of Christ, and in my mind that is taking on His character. The veil at our temples is also symbolic of Christ. It is only through Him and His merit and His grace alone that we are able to endure and enter into the Father's presence. After we all can do, after we all we can do, I think it says better this, after we all can do is just another way of saying, after all is said and done. So, it's not us doing and be, being the... Um, you know, works, works, works. It's after all is said and done, it's by the grace of the Father and His enabling power to help us take on His Son's character. I would encourage you to ask your loved ones and your friends to extend grace to you and to continue hanging in there with you so that together you can discover your dead starfishes and toss them out to the sea of repented sins. That way each changed behavior will give way to you having more power to change the direction of your life so that in time you will find yourself in the arms of father and sons, loving arms, even in their presence forever. It may be seen to be beyond your comprehension, but that is their promise. I testify that you and I can not only do this, but we can do it daily. This decision to change your direction, to change your thinking, is born from having faith in the power of repentance and in the grace and power of the atonement of Jesus Christ, who I testify took your looking for you. It works. It's real. In sharing these thoughts with you and uh, bearing my soul to you about my weaknesses, I hope it helped you see why this video on pride fits perfectly in this series of videos on the many ways we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, can dispel the accusatory fog from our lives. We all know that we alone cannot dispel this fog of hate, anger, and false judgment based on lies on our own. It takes Christ's grace and His enabling power. But we can dispel it to a big degree by first taking it out from behind the curtain and showing it for what it is, a fog of lies, deception, and sleight of hands. Born of pride, the accusers of the brethren's pride. It's the pride of the accuser brethren, like I said, who is the father of lies, even the god of, the, uh, of pleasure. He's the god of this fallen world. Satan, who is the god of pleasure, as I said. we got to be careful. He's so devious. Satan's very core is filled with pride and all its faces. So, for anyone to dispel the power behind this curtain of deception, they have to first remove the pride we ourselves have within our heart and mind. When we do, the power to lift the blindness that this fog places over our spiritual eyes will be ours as well as every other honest truth seeker who is searching for the truth with real intent. We'll have that power. This newfound power will cut through our thicket of doubt and diminish our concerns and questions, making them melt like the hoarfrost. The spirit of truth will then reveal all truth to our very knower that God wants us to know. We will know when this power is upon us because we will have become as a humble little child, having our heart, hard heart replaced with a tenderized heart that now can sense the still small voice of the Holy Ghost, revealing all things whatsoever that our Heavenly Father wants to bring to our remembrance. In closing, let me say that it is my hope and my prayer that God will bless each of us as we exercise the kind of faith that's necessary to do the work of taking on the character of Christ. And I pray that God, our Heavenly Father, will bless you in our daily effort, our daily effort to change direction, to repent daily. If you're not going towards the light and help you to repent daily so that you're 
change course going towards the holy city, walking the covenant path with your family and friends so that one day soon you can associate with Christ and his Father, our Father in heaven, in their celestial city and society as true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and live with them in loving oneness, even in the eternal joy and rest of the Lord. That is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Love you. I wish you continued success. Goodbye.